So DevOps at five. Uh, it's been about five years since the term DevOps was coined, and that's an interesting uh, span of time. Five years is about half of a normal adoption cycle. So it normally takes 10 years for something to become sort of fully integrated into the way we work, and 20 years for something to be uh, passe and just sort of the assumed and expected way of doing things. Um, five years is also when you tend to see uh, large companies getting interested in ideas um, and maybe diluting them. Uh, so I'll be talking about a number of aspects of DevOps and what it means to be here now. I'll talk about how we got to where we are, what the current state of things is, and some directions to look at for the future. So how did we get here? Um, DevOps as a term was created in 2009. Uh, in fact, it was created in 2009 by a, a particular individual named Patrick Dubois uh, in order to run a conference. He needed a great name for the conference, and he decided to call it DevOps Days, and the name really stuck. Um, this might sound a little frivolous, but it's got a long tradition. The term software engineering was created for a US Air Force conference in 1968. And so a whole field was invented out of whole cloth back then. Uh, and so, you know, conference-driven development is definitely a thing. I'm going to be open sourcing a framework on that later on today. Now, in terms of uh, uh, this presentation, I have a lot of names of individuals uh, to, to reference. And this is uh, trying to straddle the balance between giving credit where credit is due and blatant name dropping. I'm going to try not to do so much of the name dropping uh, and really give credit to the innovators who've brought us where we are. So we have this term DevOps. Patrick created it for a conference, but the ideas didn't start there. The ideas were already in the air when he created this conference. Um, these antecedents stretch back quite a ways. So um, I recall in the mid-2000s, we were talking about this thing called Agile Infrastructure which was obviously modeled on agile software development and was based around the idea of extending the sort of agility and flexibility you get in the uh, code base into the infrastructure itself. We were also talking about infrastructure as code, the idea that uh, the state of the things you're building shouldn't be described by a long document telling humans how to execute procedures because humans really suck at executing procedures. If you're going to write down all the procedures, give them to a shell script. So infrastructure as code was bouncing around. And even earlier than that, we had uh, a guy promoting the idea of infrastructure 2.0, that you should take all the machines in your infrastructure, everything you're dealing with, and treat it like one big virtual machine. That you shouldn't be involved in assigning resources to do jobs. That's the job of something like an operating system. And so we needed this notion of infrastructure 2.0, which is like a distributed operating system, except not one that Andy Tannenbaum would recognize as an operating system. But the antecedents go even farther back. Um, I actually had to go back into sort of the pre-web documents era to dig this one up. But uh, CF Engine, from a guy named Mark Burgess, was actually created in 1993. This was the original ops automation software before Puppet, before Chef, actually, before the languages that Puppet and Chef were written in were created. CF Engine was around, and it's still around, and it's a great piece of software. So what I'm trying to say is these ideas didn't come out of nowhere. They'd been around for a long time, but something made them gel around the end of the last decade. And I think the thing that really made them gel was the rise of virtualization and the cloud. Because suddenly, instead of getting new machines once every three years, we were faced with the prospect of getting new virtual machines uh, once a day, or once every week, or once every six weeks. And so all the questions of um, uh, deployment and configuration and comprehending your configuration really rose to the forefront. Mark Burgess talks about this notion of critical ratios, that uh, many patterns of behavior are determined when a ratio goes from greater than 1.0 to less than 1.0.
And in this case, the ratio that we're interested in is how long does a machine live versus how long does it take to set up? So in the old days, a machine might take a few days to set up, a few weeks to procure, and it would live for a few years. When a machine's gonna live for a few years, you can kind of tolerate that level of delay in getting it set up. But if you start looking at compressing those lifespans, now you start getting down to a point where the lifespan of your virtual machine is approaching the same duration of time as it takes to set it up, and something gets out of whack. You get a lot of pressure when you approach that 1.0 value of the critical ratio. That pressure gets relieved in our world, usually in the form of more software. Uh, and so the more software here suddenly dropped our provisioning times from order of days to order of minutes. And it dropped the procurement time from order of weeks to order of minutes. And this is when DevOps really began to matter. When we crossed that 1.0 threshold on infrastructure setup and, and uh, delivery time. So now this is the world that we're in. A little bit of my own journey and why I'm here talking to you today. Um, I've been a developer pretty much all my career, uh, except that I had this sojourn over in operations for a while. Um, I got to wear the pager and I got to get woken up, not only when my own software failed, no, no, when other people's software failed, I had to fix it. Uh, in fact, I was part of a company whose entire business plan was guaranteeing the availability of software we didn't write. Believe me, this makes sense to VCs somewhere. So I did what any developer does. I wrote code to make my job easier. Uh, we had an application server. I wrote a bunch of code in Perl, huge Perl OO modules that could poke into every piece of these application servers and deliver me metrics and make changes. Um, I built the production module structure so that we could deploy easily and frequently and keep things unchanged that needed to be unchanged, allow developers to control some things and ops to control what they needed to control. Um, and I introduced version control for our configs. At the time, this was a really radical idea. Version control is something that developers use. It's a programmer tool. It's not an admin tool. How can it possibly help admin? Now I've got another server to run, the version control server. Um, but in fact, it turns out to be pretty useful when something goes toes up and you can look back and say, you know, what happened? Oh, our cron job was disabled. Why was it disabled? Well, so-and-so did it in this commit at that time. Um, and there were a few other things that I was doing, like, you know, giving bug reports back to development with the line number where the problem was that was causing the resource leak, even though I didn't have access to the source code because I had access to a decompiler and they were leaving all the symbols in when they compiled things. Um, and so during this time, I got to see firsthand how well our software was surviving in production. And I was sort of disheartened to see that the answer was not very well at all. Uh, most of the software that I was coming in contact with had passed QA, and it was sort of designed and written to pass QA. And so I, I kind of got this idea that, you know, maybe QA isn't the target, and we should really be thinking about how things run in production. That the end of the software uh, construction project is the beginning of the life of the software, uh, and so we should be planning for it to live for some period of time and building our organizations accordingly. So I brought that uh, in this book called Release It. I tried to package that up and bring it back into the development world where I've come from, and that's why I'm here giving talks like these to try and make sure we all appreciate our software is only really interesting in production, and uh, we should be getting it there better and faster and more reliably. So that's a little history of uh, where this DevOps stuff came from. Um, around 2009, we were struggling to figure out what to call this thing. Uh, we had one group talking about web operations, uh, and they were having a little trouble differentiating that from traditional IT operations. We knew it was different, but we couldn't quite articulate it to the satisfaction of the ITIL-based uh, operations managers. We had terms like high velocity being thrown in and a conference called Velocity. Um, we had agile operations, agile infrastructure. You know, we were just searching for the right name. And there was a time when we didn't have the right name for agile software development either. Some of you probably remember this time we were talking about lightweight methods. Lightweight methods had a marketing problem. You go to your manager and say, this is a mission critical project. I think we should use lightweight methods. 
And I go, what? Um, so the right word is the difference between lightning and a lightning bug. And when we got the word DevOps, everybody immediately went, yes, good word. Two syllables, rolls off the tongue, excellent. But then we had to start arguing about the definition. What is it? What does it mean? You know, if Patrick had provided a definition along with his conference agenda, that would have been great. Uh, but we immediately started arguing about it. What is DevOps? What is not DevOps? Am I DevOpsing right now? <laughs> Might be, I don't know. So we had this guy named uh, John Willis, who uh, some people are referring to as the Deming of DevOps. Um, I like that because it makes him really uncomfortable. Uh, he shared with us this, his model that he called CAMS, culture, automation, measurement, sharing. And th they're in this order uh, for a very important reason, because culture is the thing you have to get right first. If you don't have the right kind of culture, no amount of automation will really get you into a DevOps frame. That all sounds great. And lots of consultants can come up and say, DevOps is a culture change. Uh, the trouble is, that's kind of an easy statement to make about anything. Anything is a culture change. You start doing something different, you've changed the culture. You have to say, what is the target culture that we're trying to change to uh, in order for it to be meaningful? And so uh, I want to help articulate the DevOps culture a little bit. The DevOps culture values fast feedback. You heard uh, Adrian this morning talk about measuring things in seconds rather than minutes. So you can get your uh, application redeployed 10 seconds after you break it rather than 10 minutes. Um, the kind of feedback we used to get about production systems was measured in weeks. You know, I, I make a release by posting release notes to the ops group and writing a change ticket. And some number of weeks later, stuff goes into production. And then I find out that it throws null pointer exceptions all over the place. DevOps definitely values direct connections between collaborating individuals. This is the antithesis of the sort of queue-based work order system. There usually will be artifacts and documents created. You can make a Kanban board and be doing DevOps, but actually the communication is primary and the artifacts are there for tracking after the fact. We do a lot of data-based communication. It's not who yells the loudest or who has an opinion about what uh, database technology to use or how the application should be structured. Uh, whenever possible, we actually look at things like downtime and response time distributions. And we say, this product and this product uh, function roughly the same. They can both meet all the QA requirements, but this one is gonna require downtime every, do every time we do a software release, and this one is not. This one is going to require centralized communication and centralized governance. This one is going to allow decentralization. And so we use that as part of the decision-making process. And there's an interesting um, outgrowth of that kind of data-based communication, uh, which has to do with queuing and the elimination of queuing. So anytime you have a communication pattern that requires centralized control and a gatekeeper, you're introducing delay into your process. And we'd like to get rid of that. And so part of the data-based communication is how long is it taking us to get from check-in to live in production? Collaborative and low ceremony, you know, everybody likes that. Nobody's gonna tell you, hell no, I don't want any of that collaboration stuff. Um, but a really key aspect is this idea of enablement rather than self-protection. I've been in a number of operations groups that uh, have a very dim view of developers. Uh, they view developers and developer changes as the source of all of their pain. And so they do what anyone would do. They try to protect themselves from that pain by erecting barriers and making sure that developers can't get through the barrier until they prove that they're not gonna cause pain. The DevOps approach is absolutely inverted from that in two ways. In the first way that it's inverted is that Instead of building automation that lets me do my part faster, I'm going to build automation that gives you the power to do what I used to do. And where I was going to apply judgment and analysis and look at whatever you were doing, I'm gonna to try to automate that, uh, 
that judgment process. So for example, a uh, typical point of friction is around SQL or uh, schema changes in an RDBMS. DBAs don't want developers to write their own schema changes because they do things like forget to index the target of a foreign key relationship. Well, you can have a DBA check every schema change that's going through the system, um, or you can have a program that checks every schema change going through the system. I'd rather have the program do it because they won't, the program won't forget something one time. The problem is something like SQL is actually really hard to parse reliably and examine and look at for problems. So maybe I do something like uh, build an environment where I can automatically instantiate the current database, apply the change, and then inspect the results of the change. This is a kind of work that organizations used to be reluctant to do, but is absolutely core to the idea of enablement. Another way to solve the same problem is to say, we won't specify our changes in SQL, we'll specify them in something like Liquibase or Rails migrations, which are easier to parse and easier to inspect with automated tools. Whatever the solution is, the objective is the same, it's to get the human out of the loop. Use the human to apply knowledge and judgment in building the automation, not in executing the process every day or every week. I'll say a place where we have a work left to do is with that same kind of transformation in the area of information security. Our InfoSec tools today are still very manual. You run a scanner against a system, it comes back with 800 pages, and a security expert winnows it down to the three issues that actually matter or if it's your first go around, probably the 30 or 40 issues that actually matter. Um, but essentially every time it's the same process, tool creates large output, expert inspects output, and finds out what really matters. We've gotta change that in order to get InfoSec fully integrated into DevOps. As you're looking at these culture bullet points, you're probably thinking they sound kind of familiar. Uh, they sound a lot like these uh, values of simplicity, communication, feedback, respect, courage. Uh, which you may recognize as the original XP values, that's deliberate. Uh, the DevOps culture is deliberately modeled on uh, agile culture and generally speaking, high velocity, high trust culture. Now I mentioned automation uh, as the second point of John's uh, uh, definition. When we talk about automation, again, there's a somewhat of a different perspective on the automation. One aspect of it is that we're going to use lighter weight tools. How many of you have ever been uh, the subject and or victim of something like an HP OpenView rollout? Okay, apologies if any of you actually work for HP. It's very painful, it's very expensive, and it takes a long time. So what happens Three months down the road, if you say OpenView isn't really helping us, if you have data that shows our downtime hasn't changed, our response time distribution is the same, our customer satisfaction is the same, but we invested all this money in OpenView. Well, you can't rip it out, because then you'd have to write it off. Um, you're kind of stuck with it. So we tend to favor lighter weight tools, and particularly open source tools, because we can adopt them and throw them away as the needs of the system dictate. We're not beholden to the CFO and the accounting department for keeping that software in service long enough to fully depreciate it. We're typically automating things to shorten the cycle time. So um, a lot of ops automation in the past focused on the last part of the request. In other words, you would file a change request and it would go into the ticketing system and you'd have a CRB meeting that would approve or deny the request. And after it got approved, a change window would be scheduled and then the admin would sit down and take five minutes or so to do the work at the end of a two week process. Automating the last five minutes of that process doesn't do a thing to help you. What you wanna do is automate the approval process and automate the delay out. And so uh, we're trying to automate in ways that increase the rate of change and enable safer change. 
the automation in operations also finally embraces some of these developer tools. We've got admins writing Ruby code, uh, even you know, good OO Ruby libraries with tests and everything. Um, that's a pretty cool change. Um, Adam Jacobs talked about how, uh, I think it was Adam, maybe uh, Jez or Chris, you can correct me if I'm misquoting, uh, talked about how admins actually use a lot of different languages all the time. They look at all config files in the Etsy directory, they look at uh, Apache config files, all of these things are languages for configuring systems. And admins move very fluidly through a lot of these different languages. They just don't think of it as languages. So learning Ruby as another configuration language, it's actually not that hard. Hmm? Yeah, I don't know about M4. We'll, we'll talk about that one. So underlying all of this is a shift in emphasis uh, in the operations group from automation for self-preservation to automation for enablement of other people. Instead of making it easier for me to push the button, I'm gonna give you the button. And along with that, I also have to give you the consequences of pushing the button. Um, and this is when we come to measurement. So, uh, you know, if, if I'm the one getting woken up and I'm the one getting called on the carpet by the CIO and getting yelled at, uh, literally, I've, I've seen ops managers getting binders thrown at them across a room by a CIO. Um, I'm gonna protect myself from that. First of all, I'm gonna wear a face shield into all my meetings with the CIO, um, and I'm probably also gonna make it so that you can't put me in that position. Well, the very easiest way to do that is actually just to put you on the hook for delivering quality software. Again, this is something that Adrian talked about this morning. It's closing a feedback loop that's been broken for more than 10 years. Uh, if you can create a problem and throw it over the wall and I have to suffer the consequences of that problem, two things happen. First, I'm gonna make the wall higher, and second, you never learn how to stop creating problems. But if you create the problem and you're the one who gets the feedback on it, you're gonna learn how to stop creating problems. So when we measure things, uh, we're gonna get away from some of the ideas that say, uh, the measurement system, you know, we've got one for admins and we've got another one for business and another one for marketing and so on. Uh, we're actually just gonna measure everything together uh, and we're gonna put it all in one system where you can correlate anything with anything. This has some dangers. You can easily fool yourself with spurious correlations, um, i.e. eight users to global warming or something like that. There's a whole website dedicated to spurious correlations now. Uh, very fun stuff. Um, but sometimes there are interesting correlations that are really useful. You want to enable ad hoc measurements like the number of pizzas being ordered by the dev teams. Why is this interesting? It's not so the CFO can make them order cheaper pizza, uh, but it turns out when you have a lot of dev teams ordering pizzas, uh, if it's off hours, it probably means they're working a lot and it's a leading indicator of turnover. So you find insight in unexpected places when you measure everything. Uh, and I'm gonna come back to this topic about information and information flows a little bit later. The final of uh, John's uh, bullet points was sharing. Share information, share power, share knowledge. Uh, we really wanna get away from the idea of information hoarding and try and tell people as much as they uh, want to know or are capable of uh, assimilating uh, because everyone makes better decisions when they're more informed. The big risk in a, a growing and complex organization is local optimization. I make my job easier by pushing work out of the boundaries where it falls into cracks between my box and the upstream box. So you know what happens? A new job gets created to handle what's falling into the cracks there. And now I've got three boxes with two handoffs where we could have just been talking a little bit more. One of the uh, important systems thinkers of the 20th century was named uh, Donella Meadows. Um, she wrote uh, many great books, but one of the papers that really hit me very hard is called Leverage Points in a System, uh, where she writes down a hierarchy of places to intervene in a system to make changes to it, and deliberate changes and sometimes inadvertent changes. Uh, the weakest way of making changes to a system 
is with what she calls constants and parameters. These are things like tax rates, uh, raises, bonuses, incentives. They will alter behavior, but those alterations can easily be overridden by other things. I'm not going to go through all 12 of her points, although it's fascinating reading. Um, when we get into the higher strength changes, or, or higher strength leverage points, we get some interesting things. So strength of negative feedback loops relative to the size of the effect they're trying to control, gain around positive feedback loops relative to the size of the effect. Positive feedback loops always win over negative feedback loops. If you're trying to drive a behavior out of a system, you can create a negative feedback loop, but you're way better off creating a positive feedback loop to drive a more desirable behavior. The undesirable behavior will just fade out of existence when the desirable one takes over. But now look at this one, structure of information flows. This one I find fascinating because we all deal in information. And so we have a lot of control over this particular leverage point. And if you don't believe me, put a build monitor outside your CIO's office, and I bet you that the number of failed builds goes down. Now, maybe the number of builds total goes down, and the size of the changes goes up. So you have to be a little bit careful about what you reveal. But simply making information visible anywhere will cause people to try to change that information. For instance, put a graph on a big visible display, uh, BVD, as uh, uh, Alistair Coburn calls it, people will move heaven and earth to make that graph go up and to the right. <laughs> Whether that's what you really want or not, it's going to happen. So make information visible and people will act on it. And you don't have to tie it to incentives. Nobody's salary has to be on the line, nobody's bonus, no penalties, just make it visible. It's very easy to do these these days. Uh, get a flat panel display uh, with a Chromecast plugged into the HDMI slot. If you can't get budget for that, um, ask for a real-time development quality analytics platform and go buy a flat panel display with a Chromecast. Same thing. <laughs> Looks better on a budget request. As you're uh, revealing this information, you may be asked for interpretation. Some ops people don't like giving interpretation. I had a, an ops manager one time who was uh, asked in a morning meeting why one of the web server's CPU had been higher than all of the others for the previous day. Um, and he tap danced around a little bit because he really didn't want to say, oh. But that was the answer. We didn't know. We bounced Apache and it came back to normal and that was good. As a result of that, he was required to report the average CPU of the web servers every day at 6 a.m. so it could go in the handwritten daily activity report distributed to all the managers. For two years, he had to get up, get on a conference call every morning, report a number, and then go back to bed. Well, the managers quickly stopped looking at these numbers, and my ops manager knew this, so he did what anyone sane would do. He started making it up. He took the previous day's number, adjusted it by a few percent, and gave them that number. Um, he was not an engineering major in school, for those of you who are cringing at the idea of you know, falsifying your data. Um, it, it literally didn't matter. It would have been far better to teach people that the CPU numbers didn't matter. What they really wanted to look at was the response time distribution, because that's what the customers actually experienced. And you could have reoriented the focus of the organization around a useful set of numbers that would have become a touchstone for everyone to use and keep referring back to and look at as we made changes, like the marketing group using the content management system to load an extra two megabytes of video on the homepage, for example. Um, instead, we had a useless bit of information uh, being put into a handwritten report. So my maxim is, you'll never teach yourself out of a job. When you make more info visible, teach people how to react to it. Um, get away from notions of incentives or, or questions like that. Just teach people, this is what normal looks like, this is what bad looks like, this is what better looks like, so that everybody is kind of moving in the same direction. 
The next uh, uh, large influence I have to talk about is a, a guy named John Allspa, um, uh, sort of a, a wise patron saint of operations. Um, calm, level-headed individual. Um, I, I would trust him in any kind of a crisis situation, but he blew our minds uh, back at Velocity 2009 with a talk uh, called 10 Deploys Per Day uh, at Flickr. Flickr was big then, it's bigger now, and they're talking about deploying code 10 times a day. It was heretical, it was radical. Um, that number has gone up by an order of magnitude since then. On re later reflection, this showed uh, an insight that came from the Agile community that if something hurts, you should do it more often. Now this isn't because developers are masochists, but if you do it more often, you'll get better at it. You'll find ways to make it not hurt. You'll find ways to automate it, um, rather than sort of shying away from the pain. Doctors know this very well. If any of you have had some kind of surgery, they'll tell you, get up and move. You know, don't just sit around going, oh, it hurts. You have to move it in order to recover. It's a similar kind of thing with deployments. If you shy away from it, your deployments get bigger, riskier, uh, more likely to fail, uh, more costly, all bad things. John also brought in this idea of people being part of the system and that there's a human factors aspect to operations. Psychology matters. Uh, there is such a thing as a failure-inducing system. Uh, this is one which is highly coupled, uh, exhibits dynamic coupling, so things that are loosely coupled can suddenly become tightly coupled, like disk I.O. and RAM. Um, it gives you ambiguous or uncertain signals in your readings, uh, and it may have operators that don't fully understand the system that they're operating. Um, all of these are true for the kinds of systems that we deal with. Another major contributor to this uh, line of thinking is Jez Humble. Uh, Jez gave us this uh, fantastic book called Continuous Delivery, which I think is a great way to introduce DevOps into your company. Um, it's about deployment, but it's about more than deployment. It's really about integrating the value stream all the way through the organization. And it will lead you to DevOps. And even if you don't get all the way there, you're still going to be delivering more value per unit time than you were before. So we had this idea in agile development of integrating kind of the front end of the dev pipeline, stakeholders to dev to QA. Uh, we get one team in one room working together. DevOps extends that the rest of the way. Uh, and so we should have a unified value stream all the way through. And those of you who've had any training in Lean will recognize this as what you do in Lean, you focus on the value stream all the way through and you integrate that value stream. So here we have the factors that came together, the ideas that uh, blended together and created this idea of DevOps. Okay, that was a long history lesson. Uh, done with that, let's talk about where we are now. So we're five years in and we've made a lot of progress but there are still some areas that need serious work. So I'm gonna give you my own sort of grading scale on a bunch of different areas uh, and how well they've been addressed. So in the, in the region of deployment, we've got fantastic tools now. In fact, we've got uh, an embarrassment of riches in the tools space. Uh, we've got the venerable CF engine, we've got Chef, Puppet, Ansible, Salt, Actually, there's new ones every week. Uh, so please, don't write a new deployment system. But there is uh, a place that we're lacking in this area. All the deployment systems sort of regard a machine as the target of the deployment. But I'm actually not that interested in a machine anymore. I'm interested in a whole topology of machines with parts running in different places that all have to know each other, connect, and collaborate. We don't really have much that's doing that yet. So that's, that's why it's an A minus instead of an A plus. When we're talking about provisioning, we're really talking about taking you know, bare metal and getting it up to the point where it's ready for an application to be installed. 
Um, this is actually kind of weaker than it ought to be. A lot of large organizations have developed their own highly automated provisioning systems. They're idiosyncratic. By that, I don't mean they're weird and quirky. I mean they are tuned for that organization and the way they work. They can't necessarily be picked up and put down someplace else. So we've still got some of the old sort of hardware standards around Pixie and TFTP. We've got some tools like Cobbler sitting on top of it. But uh, seriously, if you've ever tried to use Cobbler, it's, it's not uh, fire and forget by any means. So be on provisioning. Fortunately, this is somewhat mitigated by the fact that you're probably all running in the cloud anyway, and so you don't have to deal with provisioning that often. Logging is one of the places that has really made a lot of strides. Uh, it used to be logging was uh, either in the realm of security, and so the idea was write once, read never. You collected all the logs in some place where no one could ever look at them. Um, uh, or it was you know, purely the domain of commercial tools. Now we've got both commercial and open source alternatives. Um, so that, that's gotten a lot better. Monitoring has gotten a lot better. Uh, so we've now got fantastic tools for sort of graphing things from logs in you know, one second or one minute latency. Um, uh, Graphite has gotten a lot of traction, great tool. Um, not so great on the front end, so there are replacement front ends for it. Um, but a place that's struggling a bit relative to monitoring is knowing, uh, you know, are things working? So I can collect all the metrics, but I still need the human wetware to look at it and tell me, is this normal or is this not normal? Um, and I'll give you a couple of examples of where anomaly detection is still uh, kind of not really uh, meeting our needs. So we've got things like complex event processing engines that can sit there and look for, you know, event A occurs and then event B or C must occur within a certain unit of time. Um, they can aggregate a bunch of events. So, you know, if every single application server is whining about not being able to reach the database, the problem's probably the database, not the application servers. So that part's okay. But uh, one of my clients sends out a lot of emails every morning. I mean, a lot of emails. And within a few minutes, they start to see logins from people clicking in the emails. Or at least they're supposed to see logins. So what we have here is a daily pattern that looks like nothing, 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 huge spike, nothing, nothing, nothing. Except that huge spike is supposed to be you know, between 20 and 30% of the number of emails that they sent. If the spike doesn't occur, that's the anomaly. We don't really have tools that can do that yet. There was some talk at uh, Monitorama about uh, digital signal processing and sort of extracting time-based patterns. We're not there yet. I think advances in this area are gonna come from using older models from cybernetics and control systems like something called the Kalman filter, where you have a, a physical model of what the system should do, and you're looking for discrepancies between what the system should do given a set of inputs and what it actually does. Of course, that requires you to build that model, uh, which can be a little hard to keep up to date with the pace of change in our systems. So we still have some challenges there. Uh, and then there's this area that I call system comprehension, or the idea that says, you know, okay, so you can tell me that a machine is down, but how does that affect my users? Or how does it affect my revenue? We don't have much that connects through all those layers yet. There is an architecture description language called Archimate uh, that purports to do that, but it's like, it's a UML profile, so you can get stencils for Archimate, but there's nothing executable about it. I can't turn that into a monitoring system. So this is another place that we've got some advances to make. One of the cool things that we're doing um, is around this idea of um, forcing randomness onto the systems to improve them. So it turns out if you do a lot of deployments, to the consuming services, a lot of deployments look like a lot of failures. Every deployment looks like a little partial failure. And if that's not enough, um, we've got this idea of the chaos monkey that Netflix gave us that's you know throwing rocks at uh, AWS servers. There's also <clears throat> There's also the latency monkey that can inject random latency into your system to see if you're sensitive to latency. 
They've got the chaos gorilla that will take out an entire region uh, if you're meant to be balanced across regions. So these are all uh, good ideas. And I think there's more that we can do around the idea of exploiting randomness to make our systems better. One of the big ideas is that development is pr production. By that, I mean the tools and processes that you use to develop code are just as important to the business function of deploying software as the production environment is to the rest of your business functions. So dev infrastructure should be regarded as mission critical. We're also seeing an increasing degree of statistical sophistication uh, around monitoring and uh, analysis particularly. Uh, one of the big themes over the last few years at Velocity has been averages are misleading. Uh, they hide the story. You actually need to look at the outliers and the long tail of every distribution because those turn out to dominate your customer experience and your system capacity. And when we talk about experiments and, and doing different trials and confirming hypotheses, uh, we have to be aware of a couple of things. Great blog post uh, on uh, uh, web experimentation as uh, a storytelling human. Uh, the, the part I like about this one was he was doing an A-B test on a system, uh, 20 different tests, and uh, uh, one of them, the B leg of the test, showed a measurable result with uh, you know, a, a T-score of 0.05 and so would be deemed statistically significant. Um, the kicker is that his A-B test just allocated people into different buckets, and then they were exposed to exactly the same experience. There was no difference between the A leg and the B leg. But with a 5% uh, confidence level, one out of 20 tests will show you a statistically significant result purely by chance. And so we're starting to get a little more awareness of how to interpret these numbers. One of the classic errors that you see people make is running an A-B test uh, planned to run for, say, a month. After a week, the results on the B-leg are so significant that they, uh, the business says, stop the test, put everyone on B. This is actually a fallacy of experimentation. Uh, and anyone who's got their uh, you know, science and engineering degrees will tell you that you can't do an experiment that way because you can get a temporary fluctuation away from the uh, population result that will eventually converge on what you expect to see. But if you stop early, um, you may be getting a, a spurious result and you're adopting something that's actually harmful. So a few things to watch out for in the coming days of DevOps. Uh, does anyone recognize this particular curve? Can anyone read this particular curve? It works better in print. This is the Gartner hype cycle. Um, unlike many things from Gartner, this turns out to be really useful. This basically says something happens that makes a new possibility in the way we work. Um, people talk about it a lot, talk about it. We get this peak of inflated expectations where it sounds like everyone's doing it, but it's still just the front runners. And then people try to start putting it into production and many people don't do it so well. And so after a couple of years, you get this trough of disillusionment that says, you know, this can't work here. It's not in this context. We're not a special unicorn. Um, but eventually, you know, if you stick with it, real value gets delivered. The thing is, this is all about perception. This is not about the reality of value creation or value delivery. I think right now with DevOps, we're kind of close to this peak of inflated expectations, which means I expect the DevOps backlash any minute now. I expect to see stories about how DevOps is failing and how companies are wasting money and how they had to roll it back. Because if you're a journalist especially, that's the more interesting narrative now. It's not interesting to have another place that succeeds in doing something that other people have already done. What you want to do is find the controversy. And so that's why we get that. 
Now, the other thing that happens when you're right at the peak is it looks really valuable as a market. And so you get a lot of people trying to cash in on the market. Can somebody actually come in and sell you a new culture? Not really, but they can sure sell you a lot of tools. And so you get this changing effect or, or changing emphasis on tools rather than culture. To an extent, people will try to sell you culture. Uh, they'll come in with consulting engagements, uh, change management plans, change advisors, change agents, you name it. Um, and they're going to try to sell you DevOps in a box. Whether this succeeds or not has almost nothing to do with the people coming in and consulting with you. It has entirely everything to do with your team and your own readiness uh, to move in this way and create this kind of collaboration and to do the reorg and change the alignment of the, the uh, organization. Beware the fallacy of emulating practices without adopting the culture. You can put in the automation, you can get rid of the CRB, um, but if people are still looking for gotcha moments and people are still gonna get called on the carpet and get blamed and get blinders thrown at them, you're not actually gonna change anything. One other thing to watch out for is uh, this kind of fallacy of hiring a DevOps team. So I hope it's clear by now that what I'm talking about when I say DevOps is actually a merger and a closer collaboration. It's a blurring of the interface between these groups. That is really not served if I hire a bunch of new engineers, label them DevOps engineers, and now put them in between development and operations. I see this happen, unfortunately, often. Usually what that group actually is, is a tools group. They're building tools, they're building automation, and that's fine. Hire them, call them a tools group. Actually, we've, we've done without tools groups for too long. We should have more of them in our companies. But calling them DevOps is actually, uh, it's not only a misnomer, but it's a disservice. So um, a few more problems that we have yet to solve. Areas of opportunity. Uh, there's something uh, that I like to think of as the paradox of automation, which is the more you automate something, the less prepared you are when it breaks. Uh, this is true of cars today versus the uh, you know, Beatles from the 1960s. Uh, people who drove those were a lot more prepared to fix them than I am with my computer-controlled fuel-injected vehicle. Uh, an example I love is about this uh, textbook, The Making of a Fly. This is probably a really good textbook, but I'm not sure it's worth $23.7 million. This was a real price on Amazon. Another seller had it at a great deal, only $18.6 million. How do you get a textbook that costs that much? Well, to really screw things up, you need a computer, or in this case, several of them. Um, there was only one copy of the book available. We had two different sellers with automated strategies. Uh, one seller, this ProfNath, uh, their strategy was price arbitrage. They looked at the highest price out there and priced theirs 0.2% less. Border eBook had a really great reputation, and so they were arbitraging on the reputation. They'd find the highest price and go 127%. With the entire strategy that if someone bought from them, they would go buy from the other one and then ship it through. Well, the bots iterated this game for a month before someone posted a blog post about it, and then instantly they, the price was reset to something sane. Um, but this is a case of two kinds of automation interacting through a shared environment. And I use this as an illustration of what happens when we automate a bunch of things all targeting the same environment. You can get automation that starts to step on each other or conflict with each other. Uh, and it may only happen in rare circumstances, like when there's only one copy of a book. So what we need to realize is none of us are working in this sort of first order cybernetics environment. Uh, first order cybernetics is, you know, a thermostat. Uh, we've got a, a desired output, we apply some control with feedback to get to the desired output. But long ago, people talked about second order cybernetics, where we incorporated the builder of the device into the um, system as well. Uh, and we even get to third order cybernetics, where we have a common environment that everyone has to operate in. And this is where we get dueling bots and $23 million books about flies. 
So we have to keep aware of, of this kind of thing as well. So um, what's next? Watch out for dilution, like I talked about. Um, be a little wary of consultancies trying to sell you a DevOps culture. It's not a tool, not a separate team. Um, you know, it can be done, keep the faith, it can scale up, uh, it can get quite big. And uh, in the words of Jesse Robbins, uh, don't fight stupid, make more awesome. Thank you, that's it.